greetings and welcome in the name which is above every other name, that of the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son. My name is Brian Mason and this is our prayer program. I'm starting today with continuing the exposure of the purpose-driven life. Are we, is it spirit-led or purpose-driven? And this is part four of dealing with resistance who refuse to compromise their faith. And it's written by Birgit Joss. Are you one of those who will refuse to compromise your faith? I am. How could I be any different than that when it is the Lord Jesus Christ who lives his life in and through me because I'm absolutely abandoned to God. So we're looking now at uh, I identify resistors. In the church growth movement, the resistors are those who question the need for systematic change, that is, total restructuring of all facets, distrust the dialectic process, and criticize the transformational methods. What's worse, they refuse to shift their primary focus from the actual scriptures to the positively phrased purpose or vision or mission statement. And there is a warning about this so-called problem. Change leaders should expect resistance to team learning. Recognizing and making this resistance explicit to other team members tends to lessen its grip. It takes time for a group to emerge as a team and all the concerns and resistance related to teams will resurface during this period. Rick Warren is more subtle. Mm, we know another one who was rather subtle as well. When we go back to, to Genesis, the serpent, mm, he was very subtle too. And his references to health versus disease cloak his hostility toward unhealthy members who resist his agenda. Not God's. God doesn't have an agenda. It is the devil himself who has a, an agenda. God has plans. He has a perfect plan which he has been fulfilling through his Son the Lord Jesus Christ, and continues to fulfill that through the Lord Jesus Christ. In the purpose-driven church, he writes, this is not God, it's Rick Warren. When a human body is out of balance, we call that disease. Likewise, when the body of Christ becomes unbalanced, disease occurs. Health will occur only when everything is brought back into balance. The task of church leadership is to discover and remove growth-restricting diseases and barriers so that natural, normal growth can occur. Doesn't sound very at all spiritual or scriptural as that. Where's the atoning blood? Where's the repentance of sins? Where's the transformation? of life, to receive the life of God within, within the heart. Scott Peck, famed author of The Road Less Travelled, uses the same analogy. There's a term therapists use. It's resistance, he writes, in reflections on leadership, which refers to people who don't like to, or want to be healed, are converted, so they resist. The Change Agent's Guide 
to Innovation in Education by Ronald G. Havelock tells it like this. The popular manual for transformational leaders was funded by the U.S. Office of Education and the Department of Health, Education and Welfare in 1973 and continued to receive government funding until the 1980s. Since then it has been foundational to the training of teachers, pastors, politicians and change agents in diverse fields. A few years ago it was promoted on the churchsmart.com website. This page has since been removed. Comparing Havelock's model for change with the management process taught by Bob Buff Buford, Rick Warren and their common mentor Peter Drucker, one quickly sees the similarities. All use the same basic formulas dressed in different words. Phrases and illustrations. Havelock's book prompts change agents to watch out for resistors. Many social systems also contain some members who assume the active role of resistors are critics of innovation. They are the defenders of the system the way it is, the self-appointed guardians of moral, ethical and legal standards. Resistors of various orders have been very successful in preventing or slowing down diverse innovations. Resistors may be identified for having spoken out previously on the innovation or from having come to you with objections. It is important, however, to try to identify resistors. They become vocal and committed on this popular innovation. Charlotte Iserbeit, in a revealing book, The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America, shares her observations of a meeting she attended many years ago when she worked for the U.S. Department of Education. The presenter, bracket, change agent, taught us how to manipulate the taxpayer stroke parents into accepting controversial programs. He explained how to identify the resistors in the community and how to get around their resistance. He instructed us in how to go to the highly respected members of the community, to manipulate them into supporting the controversial stroke non-academic programs and into bad-mouthing the resistors. I left the training with my very valuable textbook, the Change Agent's Guide to Innovations in Education under my arm. Feeling very sick to, the, to my stomach and in complete denial over that which I had been involved. This was not the nation in which I grew up. Something seriously disturbing had happened between 1953 when I left the United States in 1971, when I returned. Then, assess resistors and determine the degree of resistance. Negative or uncompromising uncompr attitudes will be tracked using the sophisticated data systems that monitor each member. Continual feedback. From the, these high-tech systems, Brackett made available to many large churches through Bob Buford's Leadership Network, Brackett, provides the data needed to make necessary adjustments. It's all part of total quality management. As we read in the Change Agent's Guide, resistors shall be judged for relative sophistication and influence. And there are suggestions. Treat each initiative as an experiment. People are less resistant to a short-term experiment than they are to permanent change. 
and experiment signals that the leaders do not claim to have all the answers. Experiments give people more room to innovate, learn and improve, with less risk of repercussion. Measure, 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 before being an experiment. A scientist defines the desired result and establishes procedures to measure the outcome. Measurement impl implementation requires clarity about the goal and process for evaluating progress. Continually monitor the commitment level. Healthy congregations have good feedback systems. As change occurs, commitment levels will vary. For some people, any change calls for a withdrawal from the emotional bank account. That's something called COVID-1989. When the account is overdrawn, people become unwilling to make further changes. As withdrawals are made, let me just stick that under, change leaders should intentionally replenish the account through acts of kindness, good communication, love and concern. Very much in the human is this, in the natural. And where is God in all of this? Where is the, the greatest change agent, the Holy Ghost himself? Be warned. I do this in love. Be warned that this Rick Warren and these others, Rick Warren and his purpose-driven life, are very, very dangerous because they shut God out. They do not allow the Holy Ghost to work as the greatest transformer in life, of life, that there is, because he has been provided by God the Father and through the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son. Got a report now from, from Canada, this vast, vast country. And it is from the Society for the Distribution of the Hebrew Scriptures. And I note that the intercessory prayer that I did some weeks ago outside of their headquarters in Hitchin, England, has uh, had many, many views. I was very surprised at that. And it's wonderful to see that the interest in, in those being drawn to the Hebrew Scriptures. And one, one view of, uh, really quite amazed me because it was Istanbul in Turkey. Uh, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. That is from Romans chapter 10 and the first verse. And this report, I was actually split it into two, doing the, the second half of another program, Al, by Alan M. Baker. We continually praise the Lord for the ongoing distribution of scriptures here in Canada by teams and individuals in different cities who quietly but faithfully present the word of God to Jewish contacts. It always touches my heart when I learn of accounts of Holocaust survivors who receive the gift of his precious word. Personally, I know that it was from my visit to Auschwitz death camp in my early 20s that God's call came to reach out to his ancient, beloved people, the Jews, with the gift of his precious word. Over the years, he has faithfully reminded me of those who perish in the death, perished in the death camps and the need to somehow to get his word into the hands of those who survived and their descendants. I thank the Lord 
for the many opportunities throughout the years to present the gift of his word to such individuals. We recently received a request from a 78-year-old Jewish believer who came across a Holocaust survivor. Yes, when he was three years old, he entered into Bergen, Belsen camp with his family, but miraculously all were released. He lived in Israel with his family from an early age and then, then went immigrated to Canada in the late 1960s with his wife and young children. He attended Tal Talmud schools in Israel until he served in the Israeli army. He did not know anything about the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, but follows a Kabbalah, that is Jewish mysticism, sect, a Hebrew-English Tanaka and New Testament was posted to this elderly lady to give to this Holocaust survivor. We also learned of a 94-year-old Holocaust survivor, M, from Hungary. Two years ago, she was given a Hebrew-Hungarian set of scriptures. Her son died, and this had a dramatic effect upon her, and she lost faith in God. However, she has become interested in Jesus and recently telephoned a believer asking quite a few questions like, Who is Jesus and is he God? The believer told her that Jesus is her Messiah. Comfort ye, comfort ye. My people say of God, your God. Isaiah chapter 40 and the first verse. Regular reports are being received from a team of distributors in a large city. They have been faithfully distributing scriptures since 2001. The Lord has blessed them with some amazing encounters and over 1,800 Bibles have been distributed during these years. Here are a few reports of distribution by these teams. One team went out to finish the distribution from the previous week at, a, at an apartment building. By the grace of God, a great number of sets were given out. As we stated, started walking toward the door of the building, we saw the elevator open and out walked a, a woman with two children. She headed straight for the front door, which allowed us to enter the building. The first thing we did was to deliver a Bible we promised for the sister of a woman. We met during the previous week's door-to-door -door distribution. At the first door, a man in his fifties answered, as we offered him the scriptures, he asked us if we were Jewish and if the book was the Torah. We answered him by saying that it was the Torah, the prophets and the writings. We encouraged him to read it, explaining that prophecies were written about the Messiah of Israel so we can recognize who he is. He took the set and thanked us. A set was given to a young Jewish woman in her late twenties with a young girl standing beside her. She was French speaking and accepted it with joy. As the door closed, we thought she might be from the Lubavitch, an ultra-Orthodox sect. Right next door, a woman in her thirties opened the door. As we talked, we could see that she was suspicious. But as soon as we said that we had a gift to be offered to the Jewish people, she accepted it with joy and thanked us. Later on, another young woman was also suspicious at first and asked us what we were doing at her door. 
Yet as soon as we offered her the set, she happily thanked us. At another apartment, an elderly woman answered her door. As we offered her the set, a, a conversation started about the end times, and she agreed that it was not a time of peace. We said that we had to be first reconciled with God through the Messiah of Israel. And we also talked about the day of the Lord, the Messianic kingdom, and the prophecy of Zechariah. She then asked us to come into her home. We were blessed to have a long conversation with her for about 25 minutes. We bless the Lord to have had the privilege of talking about him. We went over the prophecy from Isaiah 9, 6 with her, as well as the place of the Messiah's birth in Micah, chapter 5 and verse 2. We emphasized the fact that we needed to be reconciled through the Messiah and that only his blood can atone for sin. We said that God has provided the atonement for sin through the Messiah of Israel. Another topic was discussed was the fact that there is no good work that we can do to approach a holy God. We spoke about the Messiah being the son of David and showed her Matthew's genealogy. We encouraged her to read Isaiah chapter 53. When we left, the Tanika remained open on the table for her to read. The whole time we were talking to her, she kept saying, it is wonderful what you are doing. How long have you been doing this? But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. Daniel chapter 10 and the 21st verse. Jehovah, it is marvelous in mine eyes. As I read time and time again, as these reports come in through this wonderful magazine of the distribution of the Hebrew Scriptures. And in this, on this occasion, when they were being distributed, scriptures were being distributed in Canada. And may this dear, dear one, this dear woman, and others who received the scriptures, receive the Tanaka, see their own Messiah and the atoning blood which he shed for their sins and that by revelation their hearts will be opened unto the Messiah himself. This is ours through Yeshua, that you shall receive glory unto thyself, Jehovah. Now on our world rate watch list ranking, yes, working the way through very still high levels of persecution for Christians. It's a country that I may not have mentioned before, but it's the Yemen down here. And what do the scriptures say? They give us great, great encouragement. Romans chapter 5 and the 8th verse. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he died for every Yemeni too. Heavenly Father, what love 
you have shown, when you spared not thine own beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You sent him into this world so that he would die for sinners. He who knew not sin, he who knew not death, Yet it was thy love which, which was commended to lost guilty and all sinners, sinners who are already condemned when they do not have the Saviour, the only Saviour within their hearts. And through the atoning blood of thy beloved Son, May by revelation each Yemeni, whether they live in Yemen or in other parts of the world, have their hearts opened. May they receive the scriptures, thy word as contained in the Bible, the words of life. Because what other religion has those words of life? That there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son. Because he paid the price through his own blood, his atoning blood, so that each repentant sinner and have their hearts washed and cleansed and receive a new heart, a new life and come into that living relationship with thyself, the living God. Nothing here of dead religion, nothing here of that which does not accept that thy love is there to be received by all, yet it must be received on your terms and your terms alone. This is all committed to you, O Father, for thy glory, through the name which you love to hear and cannot deny, thy beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you shall be glorified through the Son. Amen. China. So, still parts to read yet from the magazine. Uh, what wonderfully sent every so many months. Hudson Taylor Ministries, and I'm so grateful for this. And this is part of the section, which is lay preacher training. And Method 1 says, Lay Preacher Theological Sessions. The first method makes use of week-long theological training sessions. Our contacts on the ground in China carefully select around 20 to 25 lay preachers from around China to attend each session. Our desire is to seek lay preachers who have a true burden to preach and also a desire to gain knowledge in biblical reformed truths that they can bring back to their house churches. Since the time together is so precious, the lesson plans for each are very extensive. From the time they open each morning with devotions together until the time they say good night to each other. The hours are filled with biblical instruction. The teachers use theological resources such as doctrinal standards, Heidelberg Catechism, Canons of Dort, Bel Belgic Confession, Westminster Confession of Faith, etc. 
Breckel's The Christian's Reasonable Service and Burkhoff's Systematic Theology as a Guide for the Lesson Plans. The Hudson Taylor Board in the Netherlands arranges a curriculum for these theological sessions. Using this curriculum, the subject matter for each session is carefully allocated over approximately eight sessions. Different men will teach each of the sessions. Our hope is that lay preachers will be inclined to attend each of the different sessions. Hudson Taylor Ministries issues a certificate of completion for lay preachers who attend all sessions. The men sincerely appreciate the value this certificate as an acknowledgement of the learning received. Yes, it all has a part to play in the wonderful plan of God. To, on to here. Ah, oh, yes. Yes, this article, uh, quite a, a very lengthy article, I think it's going to take me quite a while, many sessions to work through it. Uh, is revival possible at a time of increasing evil? And this is by Alec Dunn. And he says, Furthermore, we re need to remember that Christ will return for the church as his holy and spotless bride. It is inconceivable to think of him returning for a weak, depleted, defeated and dejected bride, struggling to exist and just holding out against the world and the devil. Christ will return for a bride whose beauty will glorify and honour him, not shame him. It will be a glorious church, without spot or wrinkle, holy and without blemish. A church abounding in love, with the hearts of the people, and blamable in holiness before God. He will return in triumph for a victorious people, that underneath, who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, when it refers to the when it, there is reference to the Lamb and the blood of the Lamb, a people who have experienced His reviving power and are living in the joy and victory of a perfect redemption wrote William Fleming, who had experienced the measure of the reviving spirit of God in his own church. Only a holy church is ready for the Lord's return. Is he speaking to what calls itself church today? It doesn't appear to be. Very little are going to, and very few are going to be ready. Recall the wonderful words of Isaiah 62 that we use when we pray for revival. God inspired the prophet to picture a time when the righteousness of God's people would shine out like the dawn and her salvation would be like a burning torch. All the nations will see the righteousness of the church and the rulers will see his glory. The church will be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and the royal diadem in the hand of our God. As a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so will our God rejoice over us is why we are told to pray and to give God no rest until he establishes his church as the spiritual Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. And why these verses 
were used to pray down the wonderful revival and awakening in the Hebrides in 1949. In, it is his intention, that is God's, that the church should be restored and established and be so wonderful that the whole world praises her. Such a church could not possibly be weak and just holding on, but would be strong, vibrant, beautiful and glorious. We need to remember that revivals and awakenings have not only been preceded by times of great declension, but have also been signs spoken against. So we should expect nothing other before and du during the last great revival than the greatest opposition that the church has ever known. Very much fits into today what's been going on for some years and has grown worse and worse. Rebellion against the scriptures, denial of the scriptures. Yet man's extremity is always God's opportunity for greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. That's 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. A very key verse to far knowing the authority we should have in the Lord Jesus Christ. If there is widespread rejection of God, then it is time for the Lord to work, for your law has been broken. If God has foreseen and predicted a tendency on the part of the church in the latter days to decline in faith and devotion. He has not forewarned us of it, so that we may apathetically await its fulfillment, but that we may be forearmed and strive together to avert it. There is no more effective way of doing this than by preparing our hearts and pleading with God for genuine revival. There is nothing more calculated to arrest the downward spiral trend and set a lukewarm church on fire than a mighty awakening of the Holy Spirit. Arthur Lewis, Wallace I should say, points out the words of Peter in his address in the temple porch. Repent and turn again that your sins may be blotted out so that there may come seasons of refreshing from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ. And note the order. Repentance. Seasons of refreshing and then the return of Christ. The preparation for the return of Christ is made, not through passive waiting, nor even through firm believing and hoping, but as the Lord said, through praying, working, serving, using the gifts he has given us, and as the apostle makes clear, through seasons of refreshing, which are sent by his grace, in response to our prayers and obedience. Yes, this, this looks like it's going to conclude what I've been using the Secret of Success in the Ministry of Charles G. Finney by Gordon Olson. And this was sent, sent on to me by, uh, very kindly, by Jesse Morell and his ministries. Let's find 
Find my bearings. Yes, here we are. Just finishing the part on the theology of, of Charles G. Finney. Remarkably, man used by God. And here he's speaking on the, on the atonement. Some very, very deep truths here. Often overlooked in Christian doctrine and preaching these days. Atonement. The atonement of Christ was intended as a satisfaction of public justice. The atonement, according to Finney, is an illustrious exhibition of cumulative justice in which the government of God by an act of God by an act of infinite grace, commutes or substitutes the sufferings of Christ for the eternal damnation of sinners. Very, very strong that, eternal damnation of sinners. Where's that been preached on in these days? The question might be asked, why did Christ die at all, if not for us? He had never sinned. He, he did not die on his own account as a sinner, nor did he die as, as the infants of our race do, with a moral nature yet undeveloped, and who yet belong to a sinning race. The only account to be given of his death is that he died not for himself, but for us as sinners. And justification by faith, now, is this going to speak to you, you Roman Catholics, and undo the false teachings of the Church of Rome? The false decep the deceptions of a false of, of having a secure supposed security through infant uh, regeneration by regeneration, salvation through regeneration as an infant. No, no, no. Justification by faith, Finney says. When we say that men are justified by faith and holiness, explains Finney, we do not mean that they are accepted on the grounds of the law, but that they are treated as if they were righteous on account of their faith and works of faith. So faith comes before works. Works do not save. This is the method which God takes in justifying a sinner. Not that faith is the foundation of justification. The foundation is Christ. But this is the manner in which sinners are pardoned and accepted and justified. That if they repent, believe and become holy, their past sins shall be forgiven for the sake of Christ. I can't completely undoes, unhinges, so-called baptismal regeneration. But having been saved, now we move on to sanctification and Christian perfection. Now as entire sanctification consists in perfect obedience to the law of God, reasons Finney. And as the law requires nothing more than the right use of whatever strength we have, it is, of course, forever settled that the state of entire sanctification is attainable in this life on the grounds of natural ability. Finney noted that this natural ability could not be expressed as a life of entire devotion to God apart from Christ indwelling in his fullness. The union of man's will and God's grace provide the key to sanctification. This class of persons who stand in this public opinion do not trouble themselves about evaluating the, the standard of piety which is so low in the church that it is impossible to bring the great mass of sinners to repentance. 
They think the standard of the present time is high enough. While the real friends of God and men are complaining of the church because the standard of piety is so low and trying to wake up the church to evaluate the tone of religion, it all seems to this class of person like censoriousness and the meddlesome, uneasy disposition and as denoting a bad spirit in them, Quite, quite remarkable scene that uh, uh, Charles Finney actually died in 1875. What would he have made of today's church? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Matthew chapter 5 and the 48th verse. It is on this verse that Finney bases his notion of Christian perfection. It is perfect obedience to the law of God, he explains. The law of God requires perfect, disinterested, impartial benevolence, which is love to God and love to our neighbor. Christian perfection is our duty. God requires it under the law and the gospel. If God were to discharge us from this obligation, he would be given us a license to sin. Are we not always to infer, Finney argues, when God commands a thing, that there is a natural possibility of doing that which he commands? If God requires something of men, it means that they possess the requisite faculties. True saints will make it manifest that saintliness is their character by their carefulness in avoiding sin. They will show that they hate sin in themselves and that they hate it in others. They will not justify it in themselves and they will not justify it in others. In short, they aim at perfect holiness. I do not mean to say, he adds, that every true friend of God is perfect, but if he is an affectionate and obedient child, his aim is to obey always. Then the conclusion of this study which has been going on for many weeks. Charles G. Finney is regarded by many as the greatest evangelist and theologian since the days of the apostles. As a preacher, he was forceful, direct, personal, and dramatic. During the year 1857 to 58, for example, over 100,000 persons were led to Christ. Finney seemed to have the power of impressing the conscience of men with the necessity of holy living in such a manner as to obtain results. By actual research, it was ascertained that over 85% of his converts remained true to God till their dying day. It is said that at Gouverneur, New York, not a dance, or a theater could be held for years following his meetings. Finney's systematic theology is probably the greatest work on theology outside the scriptures. The wonderful anointing of God's spirit combined with Finney's remarkable reasoning powers and his legal training enabled him to present clearer views of Christian doctrine than has any other theologian since the days of early Christianity. There's that the quote from J. Gilchrist Lawson, Deeper Experiences of Famous Christians, 1971. Uh, the Intercession of Rhys Howells by Doris M. Rusco, published by the Lutterworth Press.
Is not this the fast that I have chosen? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that, and that thou bring the poor, that are cast out of thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 and 7. So these are the notes of an, ad of, of, um, an address, a sermon, by Rhys Howells at the Bible College of Wales. When the Holy Spirit asked me to love every tramp on the road, it was not I who really became responsible for them, but God. He said, you do to them what the father did to his prodigal son in the parable. I knew well what the father, that father did. I had preached on it many times. The Lord said, I died for each one of these. And when you love as I love, you'll be willing even to die for them. Only the Holy Spirit could do that. Certainly I could give money to them, but he wanted to make intercession for them. The night after he spoke to me about them, there was a tramp in the meeting, in the mission for the first time. Not one had come before this, but now they came one after another, until at one time there were sixteen, including a family of four. My friend and I helped them, found lodgings and work for them, but then they started coming to my home, and the Lord told me I was not to take a place at home that my family would not give them. I realized then that the position was going to be tested. It came when my brothers complained that the tramps showed no respect to my father and usually seated themselves in his chair. They also feared that some harm might be done to my mother through them. My father knew that if he turned the tramps out, I would walk out instant. And he stood on my side. He said, You all bring your friends to the house. And if Rhys has sunk so low, low that he only has tramps for his friends, they must be free to come too. The test had lasted for months. But after this, not one tramp came to my home. The test was not between the tramps and my parents, but between natural love and spiritual love. That is, at the deepest, deepest level you can get. Rhys Howells was tested to the ground, as it were, on many, many occasions but it led to the continuous transformation that the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, became more and more in possession of Rhys Howells and was able to be shown forth the love of God which is past all understanding the Holy Spirit living in and through Rhys Howells was so, so real. And the whole person of the Holy Spirit living in and through me is so, so real. Do you have the person of the Holy Spirit living in and through you? Is he so real to you? Heavenly Father, these are deep, deep issues. 
They are the scriptures coming to life. The scriptures being outworked. As the conclusion of this particular prayer program. I haven't even got to the uh, uh, today on the account of the revival in the Hebrides. But that will come another time. We thank thee for the truths which have come to light today and for the prayers which and intercessions which have been brought to thyself in thy throne room. And as you are seated there on your throne and I'm walking the corridors in the spirit in the heavenly places that you've heard each prayer and you shall be glorified through thy beloved Son through whose name this is asked and received. Glory to him. Glory to his precious atoning blood. Glory to his, his crucified life. Glory to his risen life. Glory to his ascended life on this ascension day. And glorify to the glorified Christ, seated at thy right hand, having all authority in heaven and upon earth. Amen.